Hello, we are Group 2, and we will present you a discussion on big data ethics. Nowadays, many organizations such as Apple, Netflix, Facebook, and Google leverage large amounts of data, also known as big data, at their disposal in order to sustain their business model. These companies not only generate huge economic value, but also shape the surrounding society's social and political behavior. According to Seagate, by 2025, 75% of the world's population will interact with data daily, and almost half of all this data will reside in public cloud. The use of big data by these organizations raises further concerns. Because the data is often related to personal information, there is a need to further discuss and understand the ethical implications of the use of personal data to avoid long-term harm to humanity. While companies and entrepreneurs are excited about the opportunity that big data can offer, the use of this widely available data raises questions such as how this data is being created and collected, who should authorize the use of this data, how the data is protected, who owns the data in the first place. These are fundamental ethical questions and the answers are at the center of debate on how we will balance the use of data to innovate and generate benefits against the risk of detriment and harm to society. We will explore four ethical dimensions of big data, ownership, consent, privacy, and currency. Starting with ownership, the idea of ownership of data is a, is a contentious one. Is the data owned by the subject of the data, the one who generates the data, or is it owned by who is in possession of the data at that point in time? Digital services are one of the fastest growing areas of trade according to the World Economic Forum. So this means that there's great potential in data and whoever owns data could be the greatest beneficiary of its commercialization. Recent lawsuits on how data is used like the Facebook Analytica data scandal means that the answer to that question on who owns data is not very clear. Data ownership laws vary widely in different parts of the world. In China, for example, data is owned and controlled by the government. In Estonia, data is owned completely by the individual and secured by blockchain, while in the European Union, the rights to data belong to the individual and that data can be moved from one provider to another. As globalization increases, these different rules and complexities means that organizations need compliance strategies to deal with the laws in the different locations that they operate. Another issue with big data is data usage consent. There's some issues providing consent, such as societal complexities inhibiting us from providing consent. What constitutes consent anyways? How laws could lag innovation, making it harder for us to legally provide our consent and hold businesses liable for not taking our consent. A potential remedy to these issues is data stewardship. There are several issues regarding consenting to data usage today. Society is complex. We use technology daily. It's an integral part of our personal and professional lives. There's also an information asymmetry. Some people have a better understanding of technology than others. So how are their consents equal? We also don't read privacy agreements. It's widely acknowledged by most US courts that a privacy agreement or consent to data collection alone is not enough to constitute consent. So what does? What constitutes consent? A reasonable effort to obtain consent is usually the standard in most North American courts for limiting liability for a business. The more effort you put into obtaining consent and informing what you're gonna be doing with this data is enough to protect the company usually. But why is that even necessary? Implicit versus explicit consent. Why do they need to tell us? That's wasting a lot of business resources. Shouldn't it just be inferred that if we make an account on Twitter, they might be collecting our data and using it for something? And what do we even care what they do with our data? These are some issues raised as well. There's also the idea of coercive consent such as um, Apple's iPhones, as was raised up by Dr. Kate in a 2020 TED Talk where he spoke about Apple's privacy policy. You have to accept it, otherwise you don't update your phone. If you don't update your phone after a few agreements, you have an expensive paperweight. So we're forced into consenting to this uh, data collection to consent, this privacy agreement, whether we want to or not, because we need that phone for our daily lives. We also have the issue of laws lagging innovation. There's a lack of laws, but today mostly a lack of accountability regarding how um, data is collected, consents accepted, and data is used. So this is something that needs to be addressed. There's also information asymmetry that I mentioned previously that could lengthen this lag of laws catching up to the innovations we have in society. A potential remedy to the previous issues is data stewardship. In 2010, Sarah Rosenbaum wrote a paper 
on data collection in the healthcare system and data stewardship. This idea is that a company or a user of data has a fiduciary duty to the provider of data or the consumer, and they need to act in trust of that data or they can be held liable for it. In application, the business may be able to collect our data as they do today, or maybe there's more laws in place to consent to obtain data, whatever the case, they obtain our data. And if they use it or sell it with malicious intent, or if uh, the intent is negligent, they can be held liable as a company, and the one who authorized the use of the data in this manner could be held personally liable in some cases. So some assumptions with this model is data regulation and enforcement standards exist. So a company knows what they can and can't do, and they can be held liable accordingly. We have a means of tracking this data so we know where it's being sent, how it's being used, and there's also international cooperation. So that way, if a company tries to skirt a law by sending data to another country for uh, negligent or illegal use, malicious intent, whatever the case being, they can be tracked, held liable in all countries. The Silomar AI principles, developed and agreed upon in 2017 by the top minds in AI and data ethics, identified two tenets focused on aspects of privacy. 12. Personal privacy. People should have the right to access, manage, and control the data they generate, given AI systems power to analyze and utilize that data. 13. Liberty and privacy. The application of AI to personal data must not unreasonably curtail people's real or perceived liberty. Looking at the implications of loss of data privacy is not something so simple as just receiving tailored advertisements. Governments and groups around the world utilize both willingly given and unwillingly provided data, with widespread surveillance becoming commonplace. This has already resulted in direct curtailment of people's liberty and widespread abuses in countries around the world. Take, for example, the Edward Snowden leaks regarding the broad and far-reaching data collection and surveillance on the American populace by the NSA. While people may be used to giving up privacy to corporations, such as Google and Facebook, in exchange for free online services, the implications of this privacy loss become much more acutely felt when people become aware of being under surveillance. Biologist Peter Watts makes the point that a desire for privacy is innate. Mammals in particular don't respond well to surveillance. We consider it a physical threat because animals in the natural world are surveilled by predators. Surveillance makes us feel like prey, just as it makes the surveyors act like predators. The threat and pressure of surveillance causes a change in behavior, with many people electing to carefully curate and manage their online image, even deleting their posts and accounts every few years. It is precisely because the risks aren't explicit and are often indirect that solutions and protections must come from a regulatory or government level. The potential ramifications for privacy are not at all simple and will require a unified effort at all levels to protect individuals and prevent disastrous outcomes. Data monetization, commonly referred to as currency, is another important data ethics topic. User data from digital services and applications can be considered as currency since it has a high degree of monetary equivalency. Commonly, users are given free use by surrendering their data in exchange for the use of a digital service or application. Corporations, for example, digital giants like Fang's companies, generate profits through use or sale of this user data. This raises societal issues. Is the exchange fair? Is the utility gained by the service or app worth the value of one's forfeit of their personal data? How do we value the data? And do users have a right to corporate profits gained from their data? How do, we, how do we reach a more equitable distribution? These questions are not easily solved, and there will be immense global efforts as resolutions are explored in the future. The ethics of big data is a continually evolving field with new challenges and concerns constantly arising. Fortunately, awareness seems to be increasing and the ethics of big data appears to be claiming a large spot in the minds of legislators, organizations, and concerned citizens alike. That said, there are currently strong competing interests in multiple regards. Firstly, corporations are highly incentivized to utilize all of the data available to them due to the strong ability for them to monetize this. 
As social enterprise and the growth of ethical investing increases, corporations are likely to face growing pressure from both governmental organizations as well as concerned investors. Just as we are seeing a strong push from many VCs and private equity firms to divest from corporations that are harming the environment, it is also likely that similar pressures will evolve with regards to corporations that are harmful in terms of their exploitation of big data. Secondly, while government intervention and regulation may be necessary to afford citizens data protections from corporations, the other side of the coin involves protections for citizens from the government itself. While the range of governments around the world are vast, from authoritarian to nearly anarchist, so too will be the response of governments to data protections. As was mentioned previously, China has developed social credit systems, highly reliant on collecting large volumes of data from their citizens. And while the EU has created the GDPR largely for protections for their citizens from corporations, it is not completely clear the extent of which they are still collecting data on their own citizens. The ethics of big data is likely to be one of the great zeitgeists of our generation, rivaling the rise and influence of the environmental movement. This is a monumentally complex topic, and although significant progress is occurring, the coming years will hold significant conflict between citizens, corporations, and world governments.